Hello guys, welcome back to my channel, Brian the Floridian. It is a cool day in Florida. We are not under the polar vortex, but it is cool, it's a high 50s. But today, I am doing a venture video. I'm gonna explore this place right here, the Soto National Memorial Park. So this is a federal park. Employees are back, it's open. And this is the rumored place where the Spanish explorer, Hernando de Soto landed. And let's go check it out. Follow me. The first thing you see when you drive in here is a sign. Let's, okay, let's go ahead and walk this way a little bit. So a little background about this park. This is this park is highly scrutinized because this is where supposedly where Hernando de Soto stopped, landed in Florida in 1539, May 30th. Back in 1513. Juan, Juan Ponce de Leon uh, discovered Florida and he's planted the Spanish flag on the opposite coast of Florida, on the east coast. But not knowing how big Florida was, they sent Hernando de Soto to check it out and explore. So anyway, let's go take a look at this fort over here. So anyway guys, this place is scrutinized because a lot of historians uh, much of them think that he landed here, which is in, uh, this is, this park is actually near downtown Bradenton. But other pe other scholars think he landed 100 miles south in Charlotte Harbor. And other people think, other scholars, other uh, historians think he landed 10 miles, a little bit north of here, which is Little Manatee River. So, but most, most historians think he landed here, so... Anyway, let's get close to, we're getting close to the fort, so let's go check it out. So the first thing you come to after you pass the sign in this parking lot right here. Some nice picnic tables to have a nice picnic right here. And here's the actual beginning of the park, I believe, right over here. Alright, this is Camp Utica. So basically here's some reacting, some uh, park employees that are re reenacting the fort back, back in the day when he landed here. Let's go take a look at this. There's a fake plastic pig right there and some Spanish conquistador weapons right there. Spears, swords, all kinds of things to inflict human punishment on victims. Here, take a look over here. Um, the, the conquistador of the night, which that's what the conquistador is, it's a Spanish knight. He would have this on, this on, and then that. Wow. Plus, there'd be additional oh, yeah, pieces the, for his arm of, yeah. of mail that would be strapped on, yes, sir. and for his legs, and then plate armor yes. put on. This is cool. Yeah, yeah. Stuff. Uh, they would they would be the ones that would have all of this on. So all, all that would weigh like oh. about ninety. About ninety pounds. About ninety pounds. Wow. Wow. <laughs> but you know our our. Yeah. Stuff. Mm hmm. Let's see, Connor, shell hammer. Well, if you like. <laughs> I took out your shell phone. Oh, okay, good. I, 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 I can make a shell phone call. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, you can. <laughs> Do they come running? 
One is our bow and arrow. This, of course, is our Native American weapon. It's also favored by the Europeans, but by this time in history, pardon me, the Europeans have really kind of stopped using bows and arrows. They're going to another, another favorite weapon, which we're going to talk about in a minute. But the bow and arrow was the pinnacle of Native American technology here. How long do you think it takes to train an archer? Any you got an idea? A couple days? A couple months? Ten years, about. Ten years to train a really great archer. And that's practicing all the time. They would start children at about the age of eight, give them a bow slightly larger than them, tell them to go out, play games with each other, with this, you know, like shoot at stones, shoot at hoops and trees, go hunting small animals. As they get older, their bows get taller, to a little bit taller than them always, and they keep track, practicing and training. What all that practice and training does is it hones their skill so that at the time they're an adult, about 16, 17, they are a fully accomplished archer and they can pull back and fire without really even thinking about it. They can also fire up to about 10, about 15 to 20 arrows in about 30 seconds. Out of those 15 to 20 arrows, 15 to 20 arrows, very seldomly do any of them miss their mark. Also by going out in those thick, dense jungles and woods, they've scouted that land. They know it like the back of their hand. They know where all those good ambush points, where they can ambush animals or even other natives. Or they also know like where the avenues and paths that they can fire, direct firing lines in between the trees so they can stand still out there. Camouflage, essentially, with their bodies painted in different colors and blending in with their surroundings. They can stand there virtually still, draw an arrow, fire it, and not be seen. So much so that we know the Spanish used to call them fantasmos, ghosts. Because all they would see was these arrows flying at them from everywhere and not really see any people. And if they did see an arrow, it was just a shadow darting like this between trees and then disappearing off into the woods. What this did is it heightened the Spanish sense of fear and anxiety. They'd have to wear that hot or cold, depending on the, the temperature outside, armor, heavy armor all the time. They'd have to stay in this constant state of stress and awareness, which will take its toll on you all the time. Making a name for itself in Europe at this time. It is the Archibus, or matchlock gun. Here we go. The matchlock consists of three parts. You have a lock, a stock, and a barrel. The barrel gets its name because of the way that it's, it looks, it's shaped like it's a barrel, lay, like with different strakes or lades. The lock is, gets its name, it's a German word. It's a mechanical device that all it does is it lowers this serpentine with a lit cotton match like that into a pan full of gunpowder. And then of course the stock is a wooden piece that is designed to be able to hold the barrel still so that it gives you stability of the weapon platform so you'll be able to aim it and fire it. The problem is, is that down the barrel of this gun, it's smooth, a smooth board musket. What that means is that beyond about 30 yards, about half of that mall, that green strip out there, about half of that, beyond that, I won't be able to hit you because my level of accuracy drops greatly. That's because a bullet bounces out of here and it can stray. So that means I aim at you, sir. 40 yards away, I'm going to probably hit her or him or probably the dirt in front of you. So you're safe. But my friend who's aiming at her might hit you. <laughs> but that's the way it is. That's why they all lined up in long lines and shot at each other from not too far away. So they could guarantee they could hit something. But when you're shooting at a native that's running between trees in the woods, not so effective. So DeSoto brings this weapon for this reason, primary reason. To get this weapon to fire, and you have to imagine this picture. DeSoto, in his armor, on a horse, rides up into a village. He's probably got about 15 to 20 arquebusiers around him. He's got the chief of the village 
the priest of the village and all the important people of the village right around him. And he's yelling, and with the aid of his interpreter, he's telling the natives this. I am a god. I can control thunder and lightning by command. When the chiefs go, really? Ah, no, you're not a god. He says, just watch. And he would load, he would then give a signal to his arc of a seers. They would load their weapons, or they would might already have them loaded. They would have real shot instead of paper wads that I'm using. They would have real bullets in it. He'd have them aim at a target, like a tree or something. And he would give them the command to fire. What you're about to see here. Do you want to call the last three commands for me, sir? Ready? Hey. Cover your ears, please. Fuego! Now, when you have about 20 or 30 of these go off, then you have no doubt that guy's a god. He controls thunder and lightning. Wow. It's the blacksmith would, would make the wire, which oh, in itself is, is a real chore. <laughs> then they have a jig that they would wind. Oh, you're very the, welcome. The, we have it over, over on the other table, that you'd wind the wire on, and it would make it look like a spring. Then in about the late 1600s, early 1700s, they developed the sextant with optics and things like that to do the job of this. Is that a game? Yes, that's called uh, nine or 12 man mills or Morris. It's a game that's been played for about 3,000 or so plus years. Kind of, it's a mix between chess and I would say like tic-tac-toe. Because what you're trying to do is get three in a row. Then once you get three in a row, then you can remove a, a player's piece. And then they move or shift pieces around the battlefield and if they get one, then they remove a piece of your guys until you Go back and forth until there's only about two pieces left of your enemy. Still sell that game? Yeah, we bought this recently. Really? Uh-huh. How did this work? What this is is a stereoscopic vision of the night sky. So they would line up principally like the North Star or other co uh, constellations on these points. These points then with the with lining up these, these const certain constellations, they would get readings off the side here. Then they would plug their readings into different um, trigonomic shadows and equations, and they could determine latitude with this. Wow. All right, the one that's upside down on the one end is DeSoto's flag. That's his family crest. And the next one up is the Spanish royal flag, the Castle Lions. The one across is the Cross of Burgundy, or also known as the Spanish military flag. So that's a flag that the Spanish would carry into different countries. So as they go before their armies. And then the last one is the coat of arms of Pedro Calderon, who was the captain that was left in charge of Camp Lucida. Uh, as you can see, connected together. So to make this, you'd have a little jig like this. So you would have like a, a little jig with a handle with a hole in it. And typically what they would do is a blacksmith would then first strip and make wire. So that, you know, to make wire, they got to pound, heat up a rod to red hot and pound it through a hole and a metal sheet and pull it through and strip wire. Once first, once they get their wire, then they stick it in a jig like this, and they start turning, making these like little springs. Once you get your little springs, then you take your clippers and you start clipping off the ends of the spring. Then you get all these little links like this, and you start piecing the links together. When you look at the pattern of male armor, it's one, one, one ring has four rings interlocked in it, and you go out from there. So then you start making pieces like this. Now when you get this armor made, you would go in and it'd be just like measuring you for a suit. They take all your measurements, and then they start making these chain mail pieces like this, 
and piecing them together in a larger like hauberk, like a shirt or coif that goes on your head. And so it'd be almost form fitting because you don't want loose mail. And then they would like thong it or tie it down to you. But that's the way that they would make this. Wow. Interesting. And then they could hit you with it as a war club. Uh, ladle. Deer antlers were used in a large variety of things, either as decorations for masks. Um, the natives would wear them in headdresses or even as, or sometimes I've seen it where they would wear deer skins with antlers mounted on their heads so that they could sneak up to other deer. Oh, no yeah, there's early drawings by the Frenchman Lemoyne that showed Timaquan <coughs> carrying deer skins and wearing antlers. And they were able to, like, when they were bent over, they would have their bows and arrows ready and they'd just sneak up to deer and... So they'd have the smell, mm -hmm. cover up their smell. Yeah. Plus, they could use the tines like this, the pressure flake, and make arrowheads. So they use the tines of, of deer antlers. So they would cut off this tine here or this antler here, and they would use it as a pressure flaker to make the uh, the sharp uh, the sharper projectile. All right. So this is a cross of Burry flag which was a military flag of the Spanish Mets during that time period, which was the basis for the Florida state flag. With the Red Cross right there. And that's the Spain, uh, that's the infantry flag from Spain. It's kind of interesting what that guy was saying back there about the flags. That's the Spanish, Spanish crest flag right there. All right, here's it. This sort of trail monument right here. Kind of cool, one of the things you see here. Before you get to the visitor, visitor center over there. All right guys, next to the Trail of Tears monument over there is this little information booth right here. It talks about Hernando de Soto his ex exploits before he decided to do his expedition to Florida and it looks like he was in Panama first in Peru at one time also and I believe he gained a substantial fortune on his other exploits expeditions in Peru and Panama but it talks about his history of going back to Spain and being a wealthy man, but he was very bored with his life, so he wanted to do another expedition and was looking at the chops to explore again, and he wanted to explore North Florida, or actually North America, and see what kind of gold he can gain from, or riches he can gain from this expedition. So he asked for permission from King Charles V in 1538 to do this, and he was granted permission. So there is a little bit of history there about that. And that's about the DeSoto Trail. So lots of traveling to find gold that he never found. And also talks about the early people in Florida that he encountered. The uh, Indians here. And their way of life. Very interesting here. And when you come to the back of this, just a little local bulletin board about things to do here around this area. Dogs that you walk here. This is a dog. This is a dog um, friendly park so you can walk your dog along the trails here. And there's a fishing, I believe a fishing area over here too. You can kind of post your catch right there. So very interesting. And there is the Memorial, National Memorial Visitor Center. That's a recreation of the dugout canoes that the Indians here in Florida used. The warriors here that DeSoto encountered
And here's a little thatch hut. Look at this. A little speaker up there. On Friday, May 30 of the year 1539, we made landfall in the land of La Florida and disembarked 620 men and over 200 horses near the town of an Indian chief named Usita. In the following days, we established our base camp on the shore of the bay which went up to this town, instead of seven or eight houses. The chief's house stood near the beach on a hill with as a fortress. At the other side of the town was, and on top of it, a wooden bird with its eyes gilded. All right, so now we're past the thatched hut, and there's a nice bench here to sit down and observe the scenery here. Got some dunes right here with some rock formations and trees. All right, so really pretty right here. Really pretty area. I'm just going to show you guys what it looks like when you walk out here. various informational plaques here about the soda himself let's take a look over here okay talk some more about the landing here and they landed here on, on this side of Tampa Bay crown right there. All right, there's this nice little sitting area out here. Right here on the water here. When you first get to, when you get to this park, you walk past the parking lot right over there. Where we just came from earlier. Take a look down here. All right, guys, let's take a look inside this visitor center behind me. Follow me. Things right here you walk into here. different exploits of the Soto and other people from that time period right here. Alright, so this is part of the main area of the visitor center right here. All right, this is kind of interesting about the explorers right there. Spanish explorers, different ones that were came to America. It actually goes way back to 1492 to Christopher, Christopher Columbus. There's Juan Ponce de Leon right there. Who first is going to Florida? And this is the Soto who is basically explored Florida. Our expedition has finally arrived. And so, from a natural harbor thought to be near Tampa Bay,
Hi, all. Thank you. All right, so let's look in the bookstore right here. It's a little gift shop right here when you walk in the visitor center. Some various park paraphernalia here. Oops. That you can purchase for yourself if you want to take home a piece of the park. Take home a little stuffed park ranger. A bunch of books about Florida here. History. Florida related books. Postcards. And t shirts here, too, also. So guys, I visited the gift shop in the, in the uh, visitor center. I also looked at a movie that was about oh, about 15 minutes long. It talks about the, uh, the Hernando de Soto's journey, 4,000 miles on his expedition through Florida and also through the lower part of the United States. And one thing that was kind of interesting was about the film was he arrived with 700 men, two women, a large number of war dogs and horses and he ended up he ended up passing away before his expedition and was deemed a total failure so basically he lost and also along that expedition uh 300 people were were left at the end so which was kind of interesting and his quest to find gold never materialized but anyway i got a couple things from the gift shop i'll show you so i ended up getting a magnet from the gift shop about a little magnet along the beach of the Fort DeSoto um, National Historic Site here. And also a postcard, which is kind of interesting too. And even shows the conquistador in front of the monument. And even the back talks about the history about this place. And this is the back of the visitor center here. It talks about the trail of Hernando de Soto. A little bit of a history here about his conquest, his expedition to find gold. All right, so he landed right there, made his way all the way up to Tallahassee, all the way up to North Carolina, cut across to Tennessee. Basically, they were lost in the wilderness. They were just running around in circles for a couple years, two or three years, until he passed away. And they ended up, and they ended up with maybe less than 300, 300 people back to, which is down here, another fort that was in established fort that was established in Mexico. So it was deemed a total. It was basically deemed a total failure. But anyway, I thought this is pretty cool back here behind the visitor center. And one thing you find at this memorial, at this national memorial, is a is also an expedition trail, the Soto Trail, which is about. Let's see. Let's look at here. There's a map there. So we are right here. So let's go take a look down this trail. All right, guys. So as I'm this exploring this trail. One of the things I found out in the video was the Calusa Indians were the primary Indians that were settled here when Hernando de Soto first landed here at this spot. And also what was interesting is that the Indians basically, you know, the, the basically to appease him and his men, they would just say, you know, that they would just say, no, you know, there's no gold here, you have to keep going north, keep going north. So DeSoto would keep going north and basically keep going north and the Indians would say no, the, the, gold is, is, the gold is more north. So they would just basically want to get rid of him and his people 
and just sent him packing up north, which is kind of which is kind of funny. And on one of the, you know, there was many battles along the way. There was many Indians that were that attacked them that were that basically were killed. A lot of his men were killed along the way on his expedition. But they also captured a lot of them for slaves, also to kind of basically help help them on their on their exp expedition. But one of the Indians that they caught, they thought was an Indian, was actually one of the one of the captured Spaniards that the Indians captured on a prior expedition. Um, I want to say his name was Juan Ortiz, and basically when they captured him, he was speaking in Spanish. And it kind of shocked them for a second, so they ended up using him as an interpreter. So along the path here, as you walk through the uh, path on this trail, you come across these little plaques here. And this one talks specifically about Juan Hortiz as they were in one of their many battles against the Indians. He came forth and just was shouting basically that for the love of God and Saint Mary, do not kill me. I am a Christian like you. I am a native of Seville and my name is Juan Ortiz. So they basically talks about his recruitment to be an interpreter for their expedition. And that's him right there. I'm sure it's a recreation of what he looked like back then, but along this trail, there's a bunch of little plaques and many pictures of um, recreations of what happened back then. Mm, kind of a cool looking runoff right here. And tucked away over here is another Spanish Spaniard here on a horse. Alright, look at this boardwalk right here. Another more another picture of a Spaniard here. Inviting me to walk this boardwalk. And I am much obliged to do it. Take a look down here. It's so quiet here. It's just me mostly walking through this trail. So definitely a lot of rich history here at this park. And I want to say this park is free also. There's no charge to come here and explore, look around. A little bit of some foliage here, some signs describing what you're looking at. So after you walk a few hundred feet of this boardwalk, you come to the end of the boardwalk here and there's an waiting for you here. A close warrior. like a little shell fruit tree monument here just really beautiful out here a little park bunch to sit on if you want to sit there and relax more trails back here so definitely Hernando de Soto landed in a great pretty area here couldn't pick a better area to land in. Alright, so one of the, th the stops here along the trail is a Tabby House Ruins. And it gives a little history about what transcribed here. William H. Shaw is credited with the construction soon after settling here in 1843. The Shaw family lived and worked here until Seminole Indian Uprising in 1856 drove them to Key West. So tabby describes a little bit about what tabby is. It's a mixture of oyster shells, lime, sand, and water. It was poured to make the construction for the house here. It talks about what they found during the excavation of this tabby house. And that's what it looks like today. So everything is pretty much gone. No more walls. There's a few remnants of um, the base of the house right there. 
All right, so wild lime. Unfortunately, I don't see any limes on this tree right here. No limes to be found anywhere. Huh. Yeah, definitely no limes. All right, let's no limes. So let's see if we can find some sea grapes here. I'm assuming this plant is a sea grape plant. Let's see. Looks like the. I'm late to the party and the sea grapes are all gone. Fail. All right, so the trail takes you to the edge of the uh, waterway here, Tampa Bay. And what sign do you see when you get over here? Is it a social point sign? You guys can read that. Picture the passage you see here. The one scattered. Oysters and plants along the shore. Go ahead and continue down the path here. Another sign along the way here. So it looks like King of Spain, Holy Roman Empire, Charles V granted Fernando a sort of mission to conquer and classify land of Florida. information plaque right here. Kind of information about the war dogs that the Spaniards brought over here. And that's a little recreation of one right there. Alright, so let's wrap it up. This is a, a sign of the trail if you want to take a long trail or a short trail. But I'm going to take the short trail today. Even though the long one is really beautiful along the water there. So let's go ahead and finish this trail here. So you have the option of taking the long way or the short way. And here are some more information placards here about the history. They captured a hundred head among any men and women. So that's the, some of the people that they captured, the Spaniards, expedition people, they caught these Indians, used for slaves, looks like. They brought over slaves of their own. And I failed to mention they brought over wild pigs also for food. So guys, I changed my mind. I took the long, the long part of the trail and I ran into this thing behind me here. This is called the Holy Accoutrous Monument and Memorial Cross. So this was a, basically I'm just reading from the uh, placard right here, the Hernando, Hernando de Soto Catholic Memorial known as the Holy Accoutrous Monument and the Memorial Cross just across the bridge from here are owned by the Catholic Diocese of the Venice, Florida. The base stone of this monument was quarried and cut in man. Cody, Minnesota, and the stone carving came from Madrid, Spain. The nine-foot bronze statue of Fernando de Soto, no longer here, was cast and sculpted by Enrique Perez. So anyway, that's what it looked like at the time when it was here. There's a statue right there that looked like at the time. right there. They're trying to convert the Indians to Christianity. There's the, the uh, 
Catholic priest, Spaniard priest there. Looks like more of the explorers, the Spanish settlers here trying to convert the natives here to their way of life. But anyway, this is the top of the monument right there. And the other side of that is a couple of nice park benches to sit there and reflect and relax on the beach. Alright guys, here is the cross memorial here. This is a little placard explaining about 12 priests who accompanied the 1539 Spanish expedition and the Native Americans who hit these shores. So these are in memory of this 12 priest. So as of right now, it is under renovation there. Let's take a look at the other side there. Look around the other side. Another place to go take a look on the beach there. All right, there is the cross. And it is definitely magnificent to look at. I'm not sure if it's lighted at night, but that would be quite a sight to see if it was lighted at night. Especially if you're there on the water over there and you're looking at this direction here. Right. Well, that's it, guys. Thank you for joining me on my adventure today. And if you like this video, just hit like and subscribe below. And let me know how you like this video. And I will do more of these little Florida explorations in the future. But definitely, uh, definitely a nice, cool little park to, to come visit. It's approximately, I would say, about two or three miles away from the downtown area of Branson, Florida. And it is free here for admission. There's no charge for admission but they do take donations for the upkeep of the park. And I encourage you guys to definitely donate if you come here, at least you know, give, you know, give a dollar or so, or buy something from the, from the bookstore. But everybody here was gracious. Um, the reenactors, the people that worked here, the park rangers were, were awesome, phenomenal people to talk to about history. And just a great place to come visit, but definitely Definitely a nice place to visit in the fall. I'm sure it's very hot here in the, in the, in the summer. So, well, thanks for, thanks for joining me, guys. And I hope you guys have a nice week. Take care. Goodbye.